Good evening, everybody. It's a little loud. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for being here. I am Kevin App. I'm the editor of the Washington Blade, and um, appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Uh, we are here to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Dr. John Fryer's uh, groundbreaking speech to the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, calling on the group to remove homosexuality from its list of mental health disorders. It is uh, impossible to overstate the significance of that event. Um, it led to fights to repeal state sodomy laws. It led to fights to enact non-discrimination non laws, protecting gay, lesbian, and eventually transgender people all over the country. Um, we have assembled an expert panel tonight to talk about this important issue. Uh, and also to talk about why Dr. Fryer's actions remain relevant to our ongoing struggle for equality. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsor and our partner, the American Psychiatric Association, and Dr. Saul Levin in particular for making this happen. Uh, it would have been unthinkable 50 years ago for the APA to be led by an out and proud gay man. Yep. So I'd like to thank that Dr. Fryer. I want to thank also Whitman Walker for hosting us and the Blades, Stephen Rutgers, for organizing it. We are uh, recording and, uh, this event and we'll be streaming it on the Blades social media channels and we'll also be streaming it uh, in our sister publication, Los, Los Angeles Blades uh, social media channels. So uh, you can relive this experience and all the people who took tickets and didn't show up can watch it as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, and thank you to Michael Key from the Blade for managing all that for us. So I'd like to introduce our panelists, and then I'll turn things over to our esteemed moderator. Please uh, save your questions for the end, and we'll leave some time for uh, Q&A. So we're fortunate to have four experts. We have uh, Dr. Saul Levin, the CEO and the medical director of the APA. Uh, Dr. Karen Kelly is a retired psychiatrist and a uh, friend and mentee of Dr. Fryer's. Catherine Ott is a curator in the history of medicine at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. And Dr. Uh, Amir Ahuja is president of the Association of LGBTQ Psychiatrists. Our moderator is Patrick Salmon, the award-winning co-director of Cure, the documentary about the activists who fought to convince the EPA to remove homosexuality from its list of mental health disorders. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to our panelists. Welcome. I'll turn it over to Pat. Thank you, Kevin, for, uh, for that introduction. And uh, thanks to the Blade and the APA for putting on this event. I think, you know, Kevin alluded to it, but it is, this is an event and a man from history, but it's the lessons from this story are relevant today in the, the ongoing fight for equality. So it's great to uh, be here to, to talk about this moment and also make some of the connections to the present that are, that are uh, with us today. Uh, I do feel a little out of place. I'm the only one without letters after my name. We're having the same group of MDs and PhDs. And it's uh, I, I great to be was a brilliant producer, director. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as Kevin alluded to, I uh, was co-director of the documentary Cured, which was on PBS that uh, highlighted this, these the events that led to the 1973 decision by the APA to remove homosexuality from, from the DSM. So to set up the conversation, I'm just going to do some shameless self-promotion by playing the trailer of Cure, just because it gives you a sort of big picture view about what the events uh, were, were about that we're going to be talking about tonight. If you were gay in those days, you were diagnosed as suffering from a mental disorder like so many people in my generation, I went to psychoanalysis to be cured. These are some of the methods doctors employ to cure homosexuality. Electroshock therapy, hysterectomies on lesbians, castrations of gay men. People use psychiatry as a reason to discriminate. Apart from the discrimination against us, it gave us a horrible image of ourselves. In the early 1970s, there was this growing rebellion against psychiatry. 
and we wanted to remove homosexuality from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. The body of knowledge which claims sickness for homosexuality has to be challenged. We could not expect our civil rights as long as we were burdened with the sickness label. Maybe it makes you feel good to be able to say that we are sick. Does it make you feel no, good? The body of medical evidence suggests well, it that it is a mental operation. There were so many of us that were at the same point. Enough is enough. We're not going to take it anymore. Period. A number of psychiatrists talked about, why don't we organize? We can make an impact. John Fryer took a step as being the first psychiatrist to say, I'm a gay person. But no one recognized him. He represented all the people who were hiding and invisible. The effect was electric. At psychiatric annual meetings, there were demonstrations, if not in fact riots. Ron Gold is a gay activist. He got up there and he yelled out, Stop, Stop it, you're, you're making, making me sick. sick. I told them in my speech, you don't have the right to decide that perfectly happy people are sick. This fight was the most important moment in gay liberation history. Thank you. Uh, a couple housekeeping items. Uh, we're we're going to call each other by our first names in honor of, of Dr. Fryer, who <laughs> here, and he said that he uh, he often called people by or referred to himself in his first name. So uh, I have respect for all of these folks, but I won't be calling doc <laughs> calling doctor. Also, at the end of this, we'll have some opportunity for you to ask questions as well. So, Karen, let me start with you before we dig into the events of May 1972. You knew John for 25 or 30 years. Can you tell us about what he was like as a, as a man and what he was like as a doctor, and, and maybe you could start by explaining how, how you met him. Sure. Um, uh, when I was um, a freshman at Temple Medical School, I lived in the dormitories and um, desperately wanted to not continue that. And an upperclassman said, well, there's this Professor, Dr. Fryer, who rents rooms to medical students in his big house in Germantown, section of Philadelphia. Why don't you come to this party at his house and um, talk to him and maybe he'll rent a room to a female student. Um, so I went to the party and John and I had a long conversation about whether or not we could share the same roof. And um, the agreement was that I would renovate the third floor of the house and um, then whatever I put into uh, the cost of the renovation um, would be subtracted from my rent, which was all of $50 a month. So, um, so that night John said, well, we've pledged our troth to one another and um, uh, that began our friendship. Uh, John lived in this uh, Italianate uh, Victorian home in uh, Germantown and uh, it was a rambling huge home that had uh, pocket doors and separate entrances. It had uh, been a physician's home uh, before so it was set up perfectly for John to see his uh, private patients in the evening um, uh, at the home which he did and as a medical student and a young doctor it was really important to me, it was essential to me to witness how John cared for his patients. Um, he had he had ultimate, he, he, he had such high regard for his patients and they were from all walks of life. He, um, he took care of patients who had no money, he took care of patients who were quite wealthy. Um, John was absolutely dedicated to his patients. Um, and we had a very sort of uh, family-like relationship in the house. We would have dinner together most evenings, uh, and John taught me how to cook, um, and um, have conversations at the dinner table. 
Um, and as Patrick mentioned, John had this, was a very tall man and had an enormous rocking chair that he sat in and would just think he hadn't seen a patient or heard from a patient and he was concerned about that person or a friend that he was concerned about and he would just pick up the phone and call that person and say, hello, this is John Fry. Um, and I think that gives you a, a sense of um, how he was in general, that he didn't have pretenses in how he interacted with other people. And was he, did he have a big personality? Was he on the quiet side? What was his sort of... Uh... John was large in many ways. <laughs> he had a large life and... But he, he, when he walked into the room, you knew that the smartest person just walked into the room. Uh, and he wasn't domineering. He, he just had a tremendous presence. Before we talk more about, about what uh, Dr. Fry, what John did in, in May of 1972, Catherine, I want to bring you in to sort of set up a bit of history here in terms of the environment for LGBT people in the 1950s and 60s, especially as it relates to the psychiatric profession, the medical profession. Uh, can you describe some of the treatments that, that uh, queer people received during the time that homosexuality was classified as a mental illness? Uh, no, I'm not going to describe them. Okay. They're too horrific. But I, uh, I can say what was happening in the 50s and 60s. 60s. And, and also thank you to everyone, to you, to the play, to the Whitman Walker, and all of you um, for coming out tonight. So the, the 50s and 60s were, were a time of, of rapid change. And as always happens in times like that, there's a lot of pushback and backlash. There, there was that generation of, of people who had served in the military or on the home front, men and women, who came back. And it was binary times, too, so it's men and women. They came home and wanted to keep hanging out with each other. So there are a lot of associations, like the Manichee and the Daughters of Politis and others. They created bars where they could meet up with each other. Um, and then with the, they participated in a range of civil rights and sexual liberation movements, all of which, including the feminist movements, had queer baiting. Um, so there, there was, it was a dangerous time. It was still illegal. Sodomy was illegal. It's not outlawed until 2003 in this country with Lawrence v. Texas. So you could be arrested for, for holding hands. I would have been arrested constantly for wearing men's clothes. You, the, many of the cross-dressing laws that date back to the 1800s were still in effect and said that if, uh, for example, a female-bodied person had to have a minimum of three articles of women's clothing. And this is the days when ladies' slacks always zipped up the side or the back. So if I had, if I'd worn jeans at the front, bingo, <laughs> I'm a target. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of possibility as well as danger still for everyone. And um, in terms of how psychiatry was changing, there, it, there's John Money at Hopkins who starts to separate gender from sex, which is a major change in people's thinking. So that's happening. In, um, there's a slow shift from thinking of, of gayness or homosexuality as a path, it's still a pathology and it's still in many people's minds, but thinking of it as not a, an inversion of libido, but it's, um, a, for men, it's a flight from masculinity, a, a behavioral maladaptation to the stressors of being a man in the 50s and 60s. So that's happening slowly. But there's still, if you, there's still all these things they could do to you. There, the law said you couldn't, you weren't, you were no longer castrated or hanged, certainly, but <laughs> you could be beaten up and killed by your neighbors, by the community, and nothing would have happened to you probably. You could be incarcerated, you could be institutionalized, you could have uh, uh, a medically induced coma, uh, a hormonal castration, 
there was lobotomy, there was electroconvulsive shock, there were a range of things that were thought of as treatments, behavioral change, treat, adapt, adaptation, I don't know what it's called, therapy, play, <laughs> the, the Playboy, I'm thinking of the Playboy magazine. Yes, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm a PhD, not an MD. <laughs> Go ahead. She said to me, oh, the Playboy magazine. <laughs> Thank you. Well, behavior, yes. Right. 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 And I can't remember, Jerry, you know, how UCLA, I can't remember his name. Davidson. Davidson. He disavowed it because it certainly didn't work. And so a few years later, he said, no, oh, sorry, I, I was wrong after the damage was done. But so there, it's a very peculiar time in the 50s and 60s. Um, I think I'll stop. Should I stop there? Yeah. Well, and this is, to, to keep in mind, this is the environment John Fryer grows up in. He was born in, what, 1930, I think. So, 30. 30, okay, 38. So he's uh, in his, in his uh, 20s and 30s at this point. And uh, starting in the mid-1960s, 1965, Frank Kameny is the first gay liberation activist who understands the importance of confronting the APA and trying to change the the... the mental illness label, take it away from homosexuality. And he pushes other, uh, you know, the, the homophile movement, as it was called at that time before Stonewall. And eventually, after Stonewall, more activists, of course, step forward and get involved in what was then the gay liberation movement. And so to set up our discussion more about what John Fryer did, I'm going to show a five-minute clip from Cured, which is the scene in the film that uh, explains what, what John Fryer did. And just to set it up a bit more, uh, Kameny and, and Barbara Giddings and Kayla Husen and some other activists start pressing the APA and that begins in 1970 at the APA annual meeting in San Francisco where protesters storm into the conference. 1971, Frank Kameny takes over the microphone at the APA annual meeting up at the Omni Shoreham Hotel. And so then in 1972, the APA says, you know what, let's bring you into the tent so that our, the meeting isn't disrupted. And so from that, there's an opportunity to present this issue during a panel discussion. So that sort of sets up this, this short five minute scene from here. At that point in time, we started pressing for meetings and public forums where we could challenge the sickness label. Some well-regarded psychiatrists started to go to bat for us. So the APA finally agreed. They gave us a really good platform at their annual meeting in Dallas. There would be two psychiatrists, and they invited Frank Kameny and Barbara Goodings. Well, when I heard about the plans for this, I said, well, you know, what you need is one person who is both a psychiatrist and gay. I got a call from Barbara Giddings. She said, John, I'm looking for a psychiatrist to testify what it is like to be a gay psychiatrist. My first reaction was, no way. He said, I will lose my job, my medical license. There's still a lot of homophobia in the American Psychiatric Association. John came to Philadelphia in 1964 to start a residency at the University of Pennsylvania. He ran into terrible homophobia there, and he got fired for being gay. He wanted to help with the 1972 meeting in Dallas. Bud had to protect himself. He said, I'll do it only on condition that I can wear a wig and a mask and use a voice distorting microphone. And Dr. John Fryer became Dr. H. Homosexual Anonymous. And I could hardly believe it. I could have fallen off my chair. We thought he would have on a nice little mask like the Lone Ranger. No, he was in this grotesque big mask, a big wig on. It looked more like Halloween than anything else. We were all very concerned about how this would go over.
I thought this tape was lost to history. I'm a homosexual. I am a psychiatrist. It is time that real flesh and blood stand up before this organization and ask to be listened to and understood. I am in disguise tonight in order that I might speak freely. What is it like to be a homosexual who is also a psychiatrist? Many of us work 20 hours daily to protect institutions who would literally chew us up and spit us out if they knew the truth. We are taking an even bigger risk, however, in not living fully our humanity. With all the lessons it has to teach all the other humans around us. This is the greatest loss. Our honest humanity. He represented all the people who were hiding and invisible. And it turned out to be just enormously powerful. It was a game changer that really got some of the psychiatrists rethinking their position. John kept a bound journal every year. This is the first I've ever seen of any, and it is from Dallas. This is right after he um, gave the speech. The day has passed, it has come and gone, and I am still alive. For the first time, I have identified with a force which is akin to my selfhood. I am homosexual, and I am the only American psychiatrist who has stood up on a podium to let real flesh and blood tell the nation it is so. Barbara Giddings and Frank Kameny have helped us all very much. I hope that the effort does not die. in that diary entry. So maybe you could offer some reflection about John and as well as your own journey to now lead the, the APA as, a, as an openly gay man. Uh, well, thank you for this. And um, it, so obviously I did not know John at that time. Uh, in the microphone, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I did not know John. I was at that point in time uh, still a very young man in South Africa, I think I was in high school, so you know, not knowing anything you know, that was going on in the United States, I didn't know really then that I was gay. You know, I do say that. Um, and as I got to learn more and more about his history and his story, you know, it, it once again reinforced for me that everyone can be a hero. You've just got to stand up and say it. And some people may not um, uh, do it as vocally as what he did and as graphically as what he did, but in some ways he changed my life. You know, uh, and he changed my life because uh, I need an organization that for 177 years, or I'm not say 50 years, essentially made homosexuality something that was pathology and something that uh, had horrendous treatments that showed no validation whatsoever. Know, that they could change someone's and their sexuality. And uh, the fact that the board uh, knew me going in, I've been very involved at the APA, that they chose an openly gay man, showed how much psychiatry had changed. And it was John and all the cohort with him that essentially created by saying what I like to say, just a few words. Show me the data that homosexuality is a mental illness. And if you can't show me the data, you need to take it out. And those words were exactly what began to change that organization because when the scientists of the time realized, well, actually, really, let's look at the data and couldn't find it, <laughs> they realized we had to take it out. I don't know if that answered your question. No, that, that, was, that, was, um, that was perfect. Thank you. Uh, Mir, what's your, what's your reflection as a as a gay psychiatrist and, and particularly wearing your hat leading the AGLP? Yes, thank you. I think when I see this, I have a few thoughts about 
what Mark Breyer did in the first, like Saul says, I think I owe my career to him in a lot of ways because I made a career out of being an LGBTQ plus psychiatrist who treats mainly LGBTQ plus people, also the director of the psychiatry at the center, the LA, LA LGBT Center, I really see that every day, and I'm specializing in something that I couldn't have done 50 years ago when this happened. And so I think, what, what this makes me think about when I watch the film, and I think about John Fryer, is that, you know, there's a saying, you change hearts and minds, and I really think you can see that and he, um, he's an emblematic person, a, 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 which encompasses both things. That you really have to both be a human being and in any movement show humanity and show why people need to be taken seriously as people, whole people, but also show data, like Saul was saying, you need to have both in order to be convincing. And the other thing is I think, one thing that a lot of young people now, I think, are getting less and less invested in institutions or feeling like institutions can't are against them. I think this is an example of the fact that there are there is room to move institutions and institutions do play an important role in social movements, whether good or bad. And I think we can push them to be on the side of the good over time. So he shows that the persistence of these activists, along with Evelyn Hooker and Albert Kinsey or the movie talking providing the data really changed a lot of people's hearts and minds and ended a horrible practice. But we'll bring this up to the president in a few minutes. One more question, Saul. You've, I've heard you talk about sort of how slow moving the APA and other large organizations can be. How, I mean, that's pretty miraculous what happened in this situation with John Fryer's assistance to move the APA quickly. Right. And it's true, any major organization in this country, be it the government, uh, private sector, even public sector, does take sl a lot slower to make major changes. And literally over two years, this organization rapidly changed its position to the point of saying that our DSM is incorrect and we now need to get it out of that diagnostic statistical manual. And that to me is what John Fry did. I, actually, as I was sitting here tonight, there's one other person that's very really, really mentioned in the story. And it was, he played a small role, but a pivotal role, because Judge Marmot, Dr. Judge Marmer. Dr. Judge Marmer was a psychiatrist, good standing, heterosexual psychiatrist, you know, that in order for you to get onto the pen to create a session at the annual meeting, you needed to have a psychiatrist member actually say, I'm putting forward the session. And they knew, obviously, John didn't want to come out, so he couldn't do it as a psychiatrist by name. And Judge Marmer stepped up and said, I will do it, knowing that, in fact, in some ways, it could come back at him. And the strange thing was, it did come back at him. A few years later, they elected him as the president of the American Psychiatric Association. <laughs> so in some ways, out of something really good, and I have to thank Dina Borland, who's my librarian and archivist at the APA uh, Museum, uh, for actually reminding me of that. Do not forget the Judge Marmer story on it. But it was John Fryer who basically carried it over the Gold Coast line. Well, it's a good point you, you bring up, Marvin, because it shows the, the uh, importance that we see here in our movement today. It's the importance of straight allies, and certainly in this, within the APA, it wasn't just people like Dr. Fryer who were fighting, it was, it was others like Marmer. And Marmer also went through an evolution. We, in the film, we have a clip from him in the mid or early 60s where he's sort of towing the company line about uh, how homosexuality is a mental illness, and then relying on the science, the activist convinced him, and then he became such a huge ally. Uh, shifting back, Karen, can you um, give us some uh, details about um, uh, when you found out about John's role in this uh, historic moment? He was very humble about it, right? Uh, he, told, he told me about it over dinner one night, uh, maybe like a Wednesday night, um, John was a great storyteller and had done so many things and traveled so many places and so as he was telling me about it, it was very, he was very nonchalant um, and sort of talked about it as kind of um, particularly about wearing the mask and uh, having his voice distorted as sort of a lark in a way that it was, uh, that it was um, exciting and, and 
not fun, but important to him, but he really didn't emphasize it as uh, a really pivotal um, experience for him. He just talked about it as something, you know, over dinner. And then his later career, can you talk any a uh, bit about what he, you know, he eventually got tenure, I know he was concerned about his job in, in wearing the mask. What can you tell us about? Well, he was at Temple for 30 years. Um, um, he, he was involved in so many different things. Um, particularly, he was uh, very taken with uh, issues of death, dying, and bereavement, uh, and was uh, one of the uh, founders of the, of the death, dying, and bereavement movement in the United States having traveled to St. Christopher's Hospice and worked with him there with um, Dame Cicely Saunders. Um, he introduced um, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's um, uh, philosophy and teachings uh, to my medical school class and America in general. Uh, he, he had so many interests in the arts and in spiritual realms, religious realms, um, he, he very much, I think, would have liked to have been an ordained um, Episcopal priest. Uh, but when he went to the uh, meeting of the Episcopalian Church that was held in Philadelphia and posed the um, proposition that uh, gay men should be ordained, it was voted down. And I remember him as being very, very sad and um, disappointed by that. That's very interesting. Uh, Catherine, in reflecting on John and the other folks who brought about this decision, put on, you know, as the, as the hat of a historian, uh, you know, too often we think that history is inevitable, but what's your reaction as, as someone who, who knows that's not the case? Well, so the, um, a couple of things the, the, to mention also is that second meeting when, in, in 71, where the, the name of the panel there were, that was organized with six, six queer people, the name of it was Lifestyles of the Non-Patient Homosexual, back when we had Lifestyles. <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> and, and Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings also had a booth at the convention. And they, as a, as a result of that, they found out that there was a, a queer psychiatric association informally that had been meeting for years secretly at the annual convention. So there were people there that had found each other the, um, below, the, below the radar. And then for the, for the famous meeting, the one of, of tonight's topic, um, a little more backstory is that Barbara Giddings, who's in, in this photograph, and I, I don't know if this is Case, one of her partner Case photographs. Yeah, it is, right? Right, yeah. um, her Case photographs are at the New York Public Library, if any of you are from New York and want to see what else she did. They, um, so Barbara and, and Kay, who had said that they thought they needed to find a gay psychiatrist, so Barbara, who lived in West Philadelphia, called around a lot of people, and everyone declined. But John Fryer didn't, and he had those qualifications that he would do it with, with, the, with the mask and wig and stuff. And Barbara also got statements from the people, many who had declined, which she also read at the meeting, and that the meeting was packed, and I guess it was electric and very powerful, and that alone changed the people who were in that room. So, the, and then they both said, Barbara and Kay both said later, that, and many people have said this who lived through that time, is that it, it, it removed a burden when it came out of the DSM. It removed a burden that people had carried and even churches started to not call people sick. They were just immoral, which I guess is a step forward. <laughs> Change is slow, we know, right? <laughs> um, but I also want to say that the DSM is part of this this Western Enlightenment way of thinking that we can categorize the world, we can weigh things, evaluate them, and rank them, including human behavior, human identities, that we do it, it, it's 
stones and birds and plants and biology, all of it. So it's part of that tradition. So it made sense to do this and then to change the categories as the weight and value changes. But it's, it's a very Western way of thinking. Um, and I think I should also point out that the DSM did not cure us all. There were still other identities we think of as queer that were that are that were left alone. So um, I think that that's what I was saying. <laughs> Before do you have something? Yeah. So it's interesting in terms of what the what's this? Yeah. That was red. No. So it's interesting as you talk about sort of that some, while they took out homosexuality from DSM, there were certain categories that were still left in there. And one was particularly around the transgender issue, transgender uh, dysphoria. And I know that in DSM 4, I think it was 4 uh, that just revised, that the issue was do they take it out? And one of the unknown things was that. You know, we have some amazing leaders in, uh, uh, in psychiatry, uh, leaders particularly in the transgender treatment, you know, or helping transgender kind of understand who they are and live healthy and lives. You know. And one of the things that they took when they were thinking of taking it out completely, because they did hear it, was that the transgender community was divided. And it was divided along the lines that the only place in order for you to get the insurance company to pay for surgeries or for the treatments that transgender wanted, that they had to have a diagnostic code coming out of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. You know, um, and therefore, there was really heavy debate about do they take it out. But if they took it out, all transgender treatments would have not been paid for, so none of the surgeries would be paid for it. And the agreement was then to leave it in. And then we took it and we changed the reaction more recently have changed it again to try and just leave it in that they still are allowed to, go to have the insurance companies have to pay for some of those surgeries. And the key thing now is it's no longer described as a disorder. Correct. Correct. Yes. Right. And uh, so, you know, I do give it to APA. Uh, they've made not only big changes, you know, when this happened, you know, 50 years ago. But still to this day, they are still looking to try and right the wrongs you know, uh, of what came out of that. And even the American Psychoanalytic Association, which you know, uh, clearly were uh, the major, that controlled the APA, controlled the therapies you know, before more biological therapy began to be looked at as well. Even they eventually came out, I think, uh, Leon, what was it, about two years ago? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, that uh, they came out with an apology to say that they were wrong and they apologized on behalf of what the pain that they caused you know, by doing uh, psycho and psychoanalysis and saying that this was a treatment that could be cured. And, and building off that point, Amir, can you talk about how far the field of psychiatry uh, and the mental health profession in general have come in their attitudes, attitudes toward LGBT people? What, what um, biases and challenges remain in terms of how uh, LGBT people receive assistance from the mental health community. Yeah, I, I just thought it was like Survivor or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, well, I just wanted to say, I think I have a new reality show, Lifestyles of a Non-Patient Homosexual. <laughs> I think in many ways interested. It's a great reality show to make. Lady really Patrick, your next project. <laughs> no, but I think in terms of the AGA, I really want to see it. But I think the, the I really think EGLP has also has a more than 40 year history, and APA obviously hundreds of years, you know, over 100 years at this point of history. I think there's a lot that we want to change faster. That doesn't change as fast with any major institution like Saul was talking about. But I think a lot has changed. And obviously, what I do for a living now, which is mostly treating LGBTQ patients, I have a lot more resources and a lot more ability than you would have had even 10 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. So definitely, I think the most progress has been made, I think, in in encouraging acceptance and encouraging and discouraging conversion therapy, which a lot of bans, especially with minors, have happened, and discouraging that practice and understanding that that's not healthy. So I think more of a solidifying of identity has happened, and I think we're getting to the place where we're consistently using affirmative therapies 
in most places around the world, hopefully, at least, you know, and, and that, at least that's what's happening in most places. Um, I think what also has happened is a lot of the amount of resources have really increased. I think no matter where you live, at least in the United States now, there's there's more resources and certainly social media and the internet have made it more accessible for everybody. So I think feeling the isolation, feeling alone has really changed. And I think one thing I reflect on when I think about this is that in psychiatry, I really believe that we have the unique ability to shape conversations about identity because we're asking people to identify illnesses, or we're asking them sometimes to identify with illnesses, but we're asking them not to identify as illnesses. And I think the thing about homosexuality, making it pathologized, was pathologizing identity. And I think what we can learn from that is to never do that again, and understand that who you are is not an illness, right? You, you, it's part of you. It's something you might have. It's not, it doesn't define you. And I think we have a long way to go for the rest of mental health to make that really, that change, because we're, there's so much stigma around mental health still, and that's a whole other coming out process people have to do, right? And there's a lot of stigma there, so I think we still have a lot of work to do in terms of helping people understand that we have normal, you know, normal variations and, and illnesses are part of you and not your whole persona. So I think there's work to do, but a lot has been done. So do you have anything to add to that in terms of the present the challenges and what needs to be proved in the future? Yeah, I, you know, I think in the end, DSM will begin to, you know, I, I, I sometimes have people see of DSM as if it's a research document. DSM is actually, it's used for a lot of research as setting parameters, but the real point of DSM was that it created a, a way of diagnosing a, a bunch of symptoms that came to a diagnosis, a, a, a diagnosis that if I had a major depression, and I landed up in another country, and I was sick and I lost my medications, and I went to a doctor, I could say, I was diagnosed by the DSM to be a, a major depression with these features. And that physician's or psychiatrist would be able to say, okay, I understand what you got, I understand what that physician, psychiatrist wants to try, and I'll prescribe the medications for you after doing the evaluation. So we forget that the DSM is actually a clinical textbook of diagnosis, just like the cardiologists have theirs. You know, just like any of the professions on any illness has what are the criteria that get you to there. But the mental health, you know, the brain has hundreds of billions of cells. You know, we are just opening and seeing the brain by the new technologies we have to visualize what's going on in the brain. And that's why you've seen rapid change in terms of psychiatry going not just from psychotherapy, you know, but now actually going to where is the physical changes that are occurring in the brain. You saw the depression and um, uh, serotonin being one of the new, we realized, oh my God, we needed to get, enhance the serotonin system. And we're about to see changes, I say to the residents and med students, what you see today in psychiatry will be looked like I saw when I started my training mm -hmm. only had three anti antidepressant medications I'm dating myself now as well, <laughs> you know, on it. To now, it's the open field of what we will cure people of some of the mental illnesses and we will provide treatment just like as if you have diabetes today or hypertension on it. And I think that's what John answered and we need to remember every one of us sitting in that room are part of the mental health, we have positive mental health, but seeking that treatment. And because he in some ways came out of the closet, you know, and said, it's enough's enough, show me the data on it. There began a change when mental illness became similar to any other illness that you had to look at. And mental illness was not homosexuality. It was some of the, some of the diagnosed depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress. Those were the illnesses that needed to be helped with. I think I'll answer the question, but I'm not sure if I went on too long. Karen, do you have any reflections about anything we've discussed? You know, I, I would be surprised. I don't think this is right. Yeah. Is it? I'll just talk about this one. Uh, I'm not sure, John. I, I think he would he use the DSM because he had to, but he was all about the person. He was. He was completely invested in that person's humanity. He was completely invested in understanding 
the depths of the person. Um, and he, he just had a way of, um, of em empathically listening and asking questions that I would say, where did you get that question from? But it was the heart of the matter. He was, he was so skilled at, um, at understanding other human beings and their humanity. Could you reflect a bit more on how he impacted your own professional development and career? I know you're, you're recently retired. Or? Yes. Um, well, John and I talked on the phone every night, I don't know, for, uh, for 20 years, I think. Um, as I became more experienced as a psychiatrist, primarily he, he would supervise me about cases. I would ask him about a question about the patient that I had, and we would reflect about that. And then as I became more experienced, he started asking me questions um, about what he should be doing with some of his patients, um, which was a tremendous honor for me. Uh, John, to his credit, wrote every single letter of reference I ever asked him for, and there were lots of them. Uh, and he even wrote one for me to go to the University of Pennsylvania Psychiatry Residency, which is where he was fired from. Um, and he said, well, you know, I have a mixed history with that place. <laughs> um, yeah, he had a tremendous impact on my career. And, and he taught me, he taught me to go, think outside of the box, to not, you know, if a patient needed a ride, you gave him a ride. If they needed a sandwich, you gave him a sandwich. Um, he was, he was really good at knowing where the patient was and what they needed. I appreciate that. Uh, as we, a uh, couple more questions and we'll, we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, Catherine, as we look at the debates within the APA in the early 70s, Frank Kameny attacked the science. I love this quote. He called it shabby, shoddy, sleazy pseudoscience. Try and say that fast. <laughs> but there was also a political component to the, to the fight that was happening within the APA. I guess 50 years later, what parallels do you see regarding the interplay of science and politics in debates over conversion therapy or gender identity? It's sort of history is rhyming, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I, a couple of things I can say using history examples is uh, back in the 50s and 60s, out of LA, the community out there was talking about um, oppression sickness, which is that idea that, and, and that is forever. If you're in a community that's marginalized or stigmatized, you will have, you are more likely to have addiction, depression, anxiety, suicide, a whole range of things that, w that they were talking about that is still true, and we still see this, especially the pandemic has made it even clearer to us, but so there's there's that, which is not really, it's, it has a political foundation because of how you're identified and treated, but it has physical, psychological, emotional manifestations, so there's that. There's also, it, and this is where things aren't changing, that in the, in the 1800s, most people were terrified of madness, and that was like the big thing, partly because Venereal disease was really common and the water was polluted, so all kinds of hallucinations and things were happening, fevers and things. Then in the 20th century, it's perversion, the destruction of the family, we know that one, the, um, Jerry Falwell and others, and that we're Western civilization founded in heterosexual families is going to be crumbled because of us, and now it's kind of that went away for a while, but I, I think it's coming back. I, <laughs> I can feel it behind me. <laughs> so it's, it, as you say, it, history doesn't really change or repeat, it rhymes. And, yeah. And uh, Amir, one, one question here, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, as, as we look at the, the current landscape, dozens of states are passing or proposing anti-LGBT legislation. What, why is John Fryer's story meaningful in the present moment, and particularly through the, the lens of someone who's working with LGBT young people and, and trying to help them? What, what can we get from this story to help inspire them to keep moving forward as individuals and as a community? 
That's a good question. I think, um, well, one thing that Catherine was saying about the oppression sickness is real, and I think there's a lot of evidence behind what some people now call minority stress. And in terms of, there's a lot of evidence that even macro level changes, such as these, like when they were doing the bans in the early 2000s of gay marriage, state by state, they, there was very clear associations with depression and suicidality, especially among young people. So I think what we do know is that increasing civil rights does change your mental health for the better, I mean, it's positive. So obviously that really is, gives us some hope that we can make a huge difference with very little, with very external factors in people's mental health. So I think what it tells me is that there's, there is hope, and I think that what John Fryer shows, is what we said before, is that institutions can be changed, even entrenched institutions over 100 years old at that point, really were able to rapidly, when moved, again, with hearts and minds, they were able to make rapid change that made a huge difference to people's lives. So I think in psychiatry, we're unique because we can, we really do get a sense of people's humanity, like John Fryer did. We get to spend a lot of time with our patients and get to know them on a very deep level, maybe know things nobody else knows about them. So I think we can, we really have an intimate relationship to be able to affirm people, give them the support in parenting and family that they didn't have, and maybe heal some of those wounds from conversion therapy, heal the wounds from their family rejecting them, having to travel across the country. I see a lot of people in LA, I see teens who live in their cars and have to make things work. And so, even now, so I think it's a lot of that that we can still do. I think as patients, they can certainly advocate for their own rights. And I think like Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings did, it took years to get to this panel at the APA. So it's about not giving up, it's about nudging, nudging, nudging until you get a result. And it's about not getting frustrated that change isn't happening fast enough, because it will never be fast enough. I mean, there's still things we can work on, but we are moving in the right direction, I think. Uh, I can't believe I'm defending the DSM, but <laughs> um, one of the... Well, it's catchy, just like homosexuality. <laughs> 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 Um, one, of the, one of the things that's, that's always been true is that identities are evolving and the, there are so many, there are people who have been, had the same desires and motivations and sexual preferences and all that forever, but the terms and the way being able to have a, a, an identity around it is really, it has really evolved so that today there are identities that didn't exist back in in the 70s, like there was transvestite, transsexual, but there was no transgender. Even the, the slang for it, I, I spent an afternoon with Renee Richards and she said they just wanted to woodwork. And I'm like, what, you mean like carpenters? And she said, no, we wanted to have the surgery and fade into the woodwork. So the, the mindset, the identity, the, the political environment, everything has shifted. So. There were no unicorns in the 70s. There, it's not in the DSM, but it, a, there are so many. The, the menu is so different now of who you can be. We can specialize in our identities in ways that the DSM could not keep up with and could not anticipate. So, final thought. And if I could quickly add to that, so you know, it was brought up about conversion therapy. So I have to tell you. It, it, the one thing, I, you know, there are a lot of things that I'm very proud of AP. The part of it is the stepping up of the LGBTQI. But it's now got to where APA spends a huge amount of time fighting in the states around conversion therapy. It is wrong, it is barbaric. You know, uh, and when you hear people using religious reasons for why they've got to do it, you've got to ask once again to them, where's the data? go on that, just like John Fry did. And APA spends a huge proportion of time within the states, because in some ways that's where we see the legislation, and on the hill here, of really saying this is wrong. This is an archaic way of seeing your vision. It does not go, you know, it does not work. So it is something that I think, along with that, and I think we were heading into that way, is, you know, as we listen to this country suddenly look and Roe versus Wade could essentially um, disappear you know, and be retracted back. 
And I worry as a man who's an immigrant into this country who came here because I thought this was the land of freedom. This was the land where you could be who you are. Um, the LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ plus community needs to be very worried because I think a lot of those legislations and a lot of those things that have turned for the positive gay marriage could very well begin to be turned back. And this is the time for both the generation, the older generation, my generation, and the younger generation to really step up and begin to say enough is enough. And I'm going to end one thing because uh, from my son, if you can go to questions, because I do want to say this. So uh, after the 50th anniversary that we just did in Philadelphia, that we were at. I was traveling back with Bob Enzing, who is my chief of communications. We were uh, coming back on the train, and he said, what are you listening to? And I said, you know, I've just seen the PBS article, and they had the 10 minutes of John Fry's speech. And I never understood what John Fryer actually said. I imagined with the mask, with the voice modulated, it was going to be like you often see, particularly around where people are in countries that are very not around LGBT and anything. They get this modulator and you sound like a monkey or a squeaky. And that's what I thought John sounded like to this audience. And I often wonder, how did he suddenly change this audience? And I think a lot were more sympathetic sitting in that audience, but there were also leaders there who were not. And I sat listening for this 10 minutes of him talking on whatever the voice modulator was. And I realized the words that he was saying spoke to, I'm a psychiatrist, there's some psychiatrists here in this room, it spoke to me as a psychiatrist to say, you know, we've really got to really look at what is the day we music, and he did it so eloquently and on, like you say, on a very human level. It was all about sort of, I am a person, I'm living, and why are you doing this to me? And I think that that I took away a different vision of what I've had for the past, I'll say, eight years of being in this position of John Fryer. Just listening to him, I say to you, go back and listen to that speech, and you will suddenly hear a man who believed that you know, I'm just like everyone else, and you need to treat me like everyone else. And for that, I'm eternally grateful both to you, Edward, to Whitman Walker Clinic for doing this. And also for each and every one of us that has walked this road, sometimes worried about ourselves and our safety, and other times celebrating. But we need the call to action. You guys, I'm talking to him. We need to really get a rally the troops you know, as to what I think is coming down the line in this country. I need that political speech, and I make it from a communication person. I saw you should have said. <laughs>